This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. As we bring you part two of our conversation with Masha Gessen, staff writer at The New Yorker magazine, award-winning Russian-American journalist, author of numerous books, including most recently Surviving Autocracy. The book has just come out in paperback. It's described as an essential guide to understanding and recovering from the calamitous corrosion of American democracy over the past few years. Uh, thanks to the special perspective that's the legacy of a Soviet childhood and two decades covering the resurgence of totalitarianism in Russia, Masha Gessen has a sixth sense for the manifestations of autocracy and the unique cross-cultural fluency to delineate their emergence to Americans. Um, Masha, you not only anatomize the corrosion of the institutions and cultural norms we hope would save us, but you also tell us the story of how a few short years ago, um, well, it changed us from a people who saw ourselves as a nation of immigrants to a populace haggling over a border wall, heirs to a degraded sense of truth, meaning and possibility as you inventory the ravages and a call to account, but also bring us hope about what is possible, what is next. Can you lay out for us, first of all, your excellent new preface to the book and what you see here, here in the United States, where you live and you teach at Bard College, to where you grew up in the Soviet Union at the time? Yeah. Um you know, actually, uh, what I've been thinking about for the last few months is not even so much the Soviet Union or Russia, but the um, uh, the other post-Soviet autocracies, namely Hungary and Poland. And the reason I've been thinking about them specifically is because they um, uh, they had a an aspiring autocrat come to be elected to office. Then they voted the aspiring autocrat out of office. They had what in the taxonomy uh, invented by the Hungarian scholar Balint Magyar is they had an autocratic attempt. They reversed the autocratic attempt through electoral means. And then they re-elected the aspiring autocrats and have been descending into autocracy since. And so... <clears throat> I actually went, uh, called Magyar and said, OK, talk me through that interim period, the period um, when the aspiring autocrat is out of office. Like, how does that work? And he said it's um, he described Hungary in particular, where uh, Viktor Orban, when his party was originally voted out of office, went to, uh, the route of saying that not, uh, not the policies or decisions of the party that replaced him were illegitimate, but its very election and its very place in power was illegitimate. And the only legitimate representative of the Hungarian people was Viktor Orban and his party. <clears throat> and that message proved to be so strong and so kind of foolproof, it is, it is in essence a totalitarian ideology because it explains everything and it explains everything away. Right? Everything they do is illegitimate. illegitimate. We're the only legitimate uh, rulers. Why did we get voted out of office? Well, because they are illegitimate, right? So it must have been rigged. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's the thing that we're seeing here. And Magyar was somewhat hopeful about uh, about. The possibility that the United States would actually be able to prevent the, the fate of Hungary. He said, you know, you have to uh, to give everybody good health insurance. You have to make sure that people's lives actually materially get better. But I think that's not enough. I think that's 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 a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition for preventing a second and more effective, more more competent and more better grounded autocratic attempt. I think what we need is some kind of national conversation. And I don't mean that we need to bring everybody who's subscribing to the conspiracy theories around to fact-based reality. What I mean is that the fact-based reality has to somehow take in the existence 
of those uh, of, of, of those conspiracy theories. The existence of people who believe that Trump will be reinstated in, in office by August of this year, whatever it is, the latest thing that they, they believe in. But also the trauma, the moral injury of the last four years, like all of this that has happened to us somehow has to become a part of our politics. And on top of that, and more than anything else, we have to have an active sort of re-envisioning, reinvention of democracy. And I think that the Biden administration does have a sense of that. I think that certainly the inauguration um, and the inaugural poem in particular had some really new um, uh, new ways of speaking about democracy, right? Not just sort of let's go back to normal, but really um, a kind of democracy as a vision for the future. But while there is a sense of that, there, is, uh, there isn't a commitment to it. Right there, we don't. We're not having the national conversation that we absolutely need to be having. And Masha, what is that conversation that you think needs to be happening? Um, it's really basic. What is democracy? What happened to us? Who are we? Where are we going? How do we imagine our lives in five years, ten years, twenty years? The the politics of autocracy in general, almost always, certainly Trumpian politics, are the politics of the past. And the, the only way that you can fight the politics of the past is to offer an equally potent, equally articulated politics of the future. Build Back Better is maybe a beginning of that, but it's, you know, it's kind of not a terribly inspiring beginning. Uh, people do have a need, and I think it, in, in sort of disorienting times, um, dislocating times, people have a particularly strong need to belong to something great, to be a part of something that makes them feel secure with others, at one with, one with others, and sort of going somewhere together. And Trump is saying, OK, let's all get together and go to the imaginary past. And the way to counter that is to say, you know, there is a glorious future that we can go to together. Well, Masha, you mentioned uh, uh, the support, uh, uh, Orban's supporters and what that uh, led to. And in the preface to your book, uh, you cite Hannah Arendt uh, in The Origins of Totalitarianism. Uh, Arendt says that the characteristics that audiences, supporters of totalian, uh, totalitarian leaders have is paradoxically both gullibility and cynicism. Can you explain how you've seen that in evidence uh, with Trump and, and also his supporters? Um, so, yeah, so elsewhere also uh, Aaron talks about a lot about how the very sort of idea of truth has to be destroyed for totalitarianism. So to, to be able to engage in this constant dynamic of gullibility and cynicism, you have to have kind of a lacking baseline, right? Uh, nothing is true. Everything is possible. And so I'm constantly juggling these two positions. This I'm cynical about. This I choose to believe. Um, usually the people who have more power are more cynical and less gullible. The people who have uh, less power are more gullible and less cynical. It's almost like you know, an 80-20 um, proportion for, for, uh, for both. And so um, that's how you get these kind of encapsulated uh, pictures of reality, like with the with the insurgency, right? Where um, I think a lot of these people, possibly all of these people, actually believed that Trump was uh, was going to be somehow, you know, reinstated if they um, first of all that he was legitimate, and also that he was going to be somehow reinstated if they stormed the Capitol and seized power in his name. And then, um, and then there were people, you know, like including Trump himself, who called on them to do that without believing it, but with the totally cynical view of these people are worthless and can be manipulated in any way. And also the, the end always justifies the means. And so, um, so this is how I'm going to instrumentalize these people who believe in me. But this ability to sort of switch between 
gullibility and cynicism is the thing that allows people to then walk away from that, uh, from, from that defeated and uh, barely defeated insurgency and latch onto a new conspiracy theory about how Trump is going to be, uh, to be reinstated in office in August. Because that wasn't true. That was silly. We, should, we never believed that in the first place, or Trump never believed that in the first place. He believes this other thing, and we're going to be cynical about the first belief and gullible about the second belief. And, you know, that, that sort of crazy act of juggling becomes kind of second nature when nothing is true. I like your rules for surviving an autocrat, Masha. Rule one, believe the autocrat. He means what he says. Rule two, do not be taken in by small signs of normality. Rule three, institutions will not save you. Rule four, be outraged. Rule five, don't make compromises. Rule six, remember the future. So if you can talk more about this, and, I mean, we can't talk in the past tense about what happened over the last four years, because we're seeing an extension of it today, for example, around voting rights. And I was wondering if you can talk about the significance of this. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, uh, that uh, about sort of the, the talking in, in the past tense and about the difference, um, about the rush to relegate to memory something that is still happening, right? Uh, we're still seeing a, an anti-democratic party under, effectively under Trump's leadership, actively fight democracy, right? Um, we, we're still there, right? So, um, so, so I, th I think that, uh, you know, that's, that's a really great point that, uh, that she can draw a line, which, you know, as I think, uh, um, the Biden administration would really love to do, right? Like that was then, this is now. Um, but it's not. This, this, the, the nightmare is continuing. And what specific uh, issues uh, now uh, uh, do you think are like continuities between what uh, happened under Trump, the Republican Party then, and continuities you've warned against uh, uh, the risk of inheriting and continuing a Trumpist Republican Party. What other uh, issues do you see uh, as continuous? Well, I think the biggest thing, and I think everything else sort of grows out of it, the biggest thing is that um, there was this, uh, I think, fantasy, uh, not unlike the fantasy that Trump was suddenly going to become presidential after being elected, but uh, this fantasy that the Republican Party was going to go back to its saner self once Trump was out of office, based on, I think, this premise—well, uh, based on two premises. One is that it, uh, that there were enough Republicans who would want to do that, and two, on the premise that Trump would no longer have his hold on the Republican Party. But he can, as we see, he still wields the power of political assassination uh, by, you know, if not by tweet, but now by, you know, by other means, by, by, uh, by, by public speaking. And so— um, when he can threaten to encourage a primary candidate uh, against any Republican whom he sees as crossing him. And so we're seeing that the Republican Party is solidifying as an, as an autocratic party, a party that has an audience of one, and that one person is Donald Trump. The Democratic Party, for all its flaws, is a party that has an audience of many, some a lot of the the people who, uh, in that audience are donors, but uh, but they're also voters, right? Um, and um, and that's a very different kind of party. But we only have one of those. Um, and I think everything else, including the the really you know the the the, the, the terrifying voter suppression bills, uh, such as, such as the one that we were just watching in in Texas, the. Uh, the other ways in which uh, Republicans are sort of pursuing an agenda, and, and I think of it as uh, this way, right, it's sort of a holistic agenda of disenfranchisement, whether it's through ban, you know, through fighting critical race theory or girls in, uh, or trans girls in sports, uh, these are all sort of ways of saying you are not us. Uh, 
the 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 picture of who we are has to keep getting smaller and smaller and other people have to be excluded from public space from political space from community from opportunity uh, and all of that grows out of that sort of the autocratic impulse of this republican party you mentioned masha <clears throat> hungry before and i want to talk about hungary and the united states um, in our headlines today, uh, we reported on human rights advocates denouncing new anti-LGBTQ legislation passed by lawmakers yesterday that bans media, advertisers and other outlets from showing children any content that portrays gay, lesbian, bisexual or transgender people and prohibits teaching about LGBTQ issues at schools. And it's the far-right party of the Hungarian prime minister, Viktor Orban, introducing the legislation attached to a bill that more strictly penalizes child abuse. And then I want to ask you about a piece you wrote in The New Yorker. So to talk about what's happening in Hungary and in Russia around the issue of LGBTQ rights, and then the piece you wrote in the United States, um, the movement to exclude trans girls from sports. Yeah, I think I think that these uh, you're right to uh, to ask about these two things in the in the in the same breath because they're certainly related. Uh, anti LGBT legislation in general is rooted in these kind of manufactured moral panics, uh, also sometimes rooted in this idea of common sense, which is not common sense. It's just, you know, it's, it's just it's just prejudice and um, and panic. But, you know, by common sense, I mean this uh, in in Russia and and Hungary these ideas that are in the air, right, that uh, that the gays are after your children, that you have to protect your children, that um, <clears throat> that somehow there's a connection between queer people and and danger, particularly to children, the thing that you have to protect most. Right. Um, and the common sense that, of course, you know, trans girls are probably stronger than uh, than cis girls and shouldn't be allowed to to play sports that passes for common sense. Uh, actually doesn't have anything to do, to do with reality, but does have a kind of unifying uh, um, unifying appeal, right? Because everybody knows this, we can agree on this. But the unifying appeal is also um, is also this the sort of definition of community, right? It's uh, the reason that so many countries that are sliding into autocracy are passing anti-gay legislation is because advances in LGBT rights uh, has been the most rapid and the most significant social change in a lot of countries in the last two decades. And so this past-oriented politics, where the autocrat says, if you want to be transported magically to a time when you, were, when you felt comfortable, when you were not constantly being upset and irritated by things you don't understand— we have to reverse social change, and specifically the most recent social change. And that seems to make a kind of sense. And I think that's, that's why we're, we're, we're seeing these, um, uh, these bills all over the place. It's, it's almost tempting to say, oh, you know, the Russians are exporting their, uh, their lawmaking um, or their Amer the American homophobes, you know, exported theirs to Russia. And there's a little bit of truth to that, but it's not really that. It's the it's the kind of it's the underlying logic of of social change, of of extreme anxiety, and of this desire to go to to an imaginary past. Masha Gessen, thanks so much for being with us. Also, congratulations on the release of the paperback of Surviving Autocracy. Masha Gessen, staff writer at The New Yorker. We will link to all your pieces in The New Yorker, your recent pieces, award-winning journalist. Um, again, that book, Surviving Autocracy. To see part one of our discussion on this day of the Putin-Biden summit, you can go to democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Thanks so much for joining us.